Book Eight, Part One of the Aeneid. Reading by Lars Rolander. The Aeneid by Publius Virgilius Maro. Translated by John Dryden. Book Eight, Arcadian Allies, Part One. When Turnus had assembled all his powers, his standard planted on Laurentium's towers, when now the springly trumpet from afar had given the signal of approaching war, had roused the neighing steeds to score the fields, while the fierce riders clattered on their shields, trembling with rage the Latian youth prepare to join the allies and headlong rush to war. Fierce Ufens and Mesopus led the crowd, with bold Mesentius, who blasphemed aloud. These through the country took their wasteful course, the fields to forage and to gather force. Then Venulus to Diomed they send, to beg his aid Asonia to defend, declare the common danger and inform the Grecian leader of the growing storm. Aeneas landed on the Latian coast, with banished gods and with a baffled host, yet now aspired to conquest of the state, and claimed a title from the gods and fate. What numerous nations in his quarrel came, and how they spread his formidable name, what he designed, what mischief might arise, if fortune favoured his first enterprise, was left for him to weigh whose equal fears and common interest was involved in theirs. While Turnus and the allies thus urged the war, the Trojan floating in a flood of care, beholds the tempest which his foes prepare, this way, and that he turns his anxious mind, thinks and rejects the counsels he designed, explores himself in vain in every part, and gives no rest to his distracted heart. So when the sun by day or moon by night strike on the polished brass that trembling light, the glittering species here and there divide, and cast their dubious beams from side to side. Now on the walls, now on the pavement play, and to the ceiling flash the glaring day. It was night, and weary nature lulled asleep, the birds of air and fishes of the deep, and beasts and mortal men, the Trojan chief, was laid on Tiber's bank, oppressed with grief, and found in silent slumber late relief. Then through the shadows of the poplar wood arose the father of the Roman flood. An azure robe was over his body spread, a wreath of shady rays adorned his head. Thus manifest to sight the god appeared, and with these pleasing words his sorrow cheered. Undoubted offspring of ethereal race, O oh, long expected in this promised place, who through the foes hast borne thy banished gods, restore them to their hearths and old abodes. This is thy happy home, the clime where fate ordains thee to restore the Trojan state. Fear not, the war shall end in lasting peace, and all the rage of haughty Juno cease, and that this nightly vision may not seem the effect of fancy or an idle dream. A sow beneath an oak shall lie along, all white herself, and white her thirty young. When thirty rolling years have run the race, thy son, Ascanius, on this empty space, shall build a royal town of lasting fame, which from this omen shall receive the name. Time shall approve the truth for what remains, and how with sure success to crown thy pains. With patience next attend a banished band, driven with Evander from the Arcadian land, have planted here and placed on high their walls, their town the founder Palantium calls. Derived from Pallas, his great-grandsire's name, but the fierce Latian's old possession claim. With war infesting the new colony, these make thy friends, and on their aid rely. 
To thy free passage I submit my streams, Wake, son of Venus, from thy pleasing dreams. And when the setting stars are lost in day, To Juno's power thy just devotion pay. With sacrifice the wrathful queen appease, Her pride at length shall fall, her fury cease. When thou returnst victorious from the war, Perform thy vows to me with grateful care. The god am I, whose gel of water flows Around these fields, it fattens as it goes. Tiber my name among the rolling floods, Renowned on earth, esteemed among the gods. This is my certain seat in times to come, My waves shall wash the walls of mighty Rome. He said and plunged below, while yet he spoke, his dream Aeneas and his sleep forsook. He rose, and looking up beheld the skies, With purple blushing, and the day arise. The water in his hollow palm he took, From Tiber's flood, and thus the powers bespoke. Laurentian nymphs, by whom the streams are fed, And Father Tiber in thy sacred bed, Receive Aeneas, and from danger keep, Whatever found, whatever holy deep. Conceals thy watery stores wherever they rise, And bubbling from below salute the skies. Thou king of horned floods, whose plenteous urn Suffices fatness to the fruitful corn, For this thy kind compassion of our woes Shall share my morning song and evening woes. But, O, oh, be present to thy people's aid, And firm the gracious promise thou hast made. Thus, having said to Gallus from his stores, With care he chooses, mans, and fits with oars. Now on the shore the fatal swine is found, Wondrous to tell she lay along the ground. Her well-fed offspring at her others hung, She white herself, and white her thirty young. Aeneas takes the mother and her brood, And all on Juno's altar are bestowed. The following night and the succeeding day, Propitious Tiber smoothed his watery way. He rolled his river back, and poised he stood, A gentle swelling and a peaceful flood. The Trojans mount their ships, they put from shore, Borne on the waves, and scarcely dip an oar. Shouts from the land give omen to their course, And the pitched vessels glide with easy force. The woods and waters wonder at the gleam Of shields and painted ships that stem the stream. One summer's night and one whole day they pass Betwixt the greenwood shades and cut the liquid glass. The fiery sun had finished half his race, Looked back and doubted in the middle space. When they from far beheld the rising towers, the tops of sheds and shepherds lowly bars, thin as they stood, which then on homely clay now rise in marble from the Roman sway. These cots, Evander's kingdom, mean and poor, the Trojan saw and turned his ships to shore. It was a solemn day, the Arcadian states, the king and prince without the city gates, then paid their offsprings in a sacred groove, to Hercules, the warrior son of Joe. Thick clouds of rolling smoke involve the skies, And fat of entrails on his altar fries. But when they saw the ship that stemmed the flood, And glittered through the covert of the wood, They rose with fear, and left the unfinished feast, Till dauntless Pallas reassured the rest, To pay the rites himself without delay, a javelin ceased, and singly took his way, Then gained a rising ground, and called from far, Resolve me, strangers, whence and what you are, Your business here, and bring you peace or war. High on the stern Aeneas his stand, And held a branch of olive in his hand. While thus he spoke, The Phrygans' arms you see, Expelled from Troy, provoked in Italy, By Latian foes, with war unjustly made, At first affianced, then at last betrayed. 
This message bear, the Trojans and their chief, bring holy peace and beg the king's relief. Struck with so great a name and all on fire, the youth replies, whatever you require. Your fame exacts upon our shores descend, a welcome guest and what you wish a friend. He said, and downward hasting to the strand, embraced the stranger prince and joined his hand. Conducted to the groove, Aeneas broke, the silence first, and thus the king bespoke, Best of the Greeks to whom, by fate's command, I bear these peaceful branches in my hand. Undaunted I approach you, thou I know, your birth is Grecian, and your land my foe. From Artres, though your ancient lineage came, and boast the brother kings your kindred claim. Yet myself, conscious worth, your high renown, your virtue through neither neighboring nations blown. Our father's mingled blood, Apollo's voice, have led me hither, less my need than choice. Our founder, Dardanus, as fame has sung, and Greeks and knowledge from Electra sprung. Electra from the loins of Atlas came, Atlas whose head sustains the starry frame. Your sire is Mercury, whom long before, on cold Kalinus' top fair Maya bore. Maya the fair, on fame if we rely, was Atlas' daughter, who sustains the sky. Thus from one common source our streams divide, Ours is the Trojan, yours the Aridian side. Raised by these hopes, I sent no news before, nor asked your leave, nor did your faith implore. But come, without a pledge, my own ambassador, the same Rutulians who with arms pursue the Trojan race are equal foes to you. Our host expelled what farther force can stay, the victor troops from universal sway. Then, when they stretch their power at worth the land, and either sea from side to side command, receive our offered faith and give us thine. Ours is a generous and experienced line. We want no hearts nor bodies for the war. In council cautious and in fields we dare. He said, and while spoke, with piercing eyes, Evander viewed the man with vast surprise. Pleased with his action, ravished with his face, then answered briefly with a royal grace. O valiant leader of the Trojan line, in whom the features of thy father shine, how I recall Anchises, how I see his motions, mean and all my friend in thee. Long though it be, it's fresh within my mind, when Priam to his sister's court designed. A welcome visit with a friendly stay, and through the Arcadian kingdom took his way. And then past a boy the callow down began, to shade my chin and call me first a man. I saw the shining train with vast delight, and Priam's goodly person pleased my sight. But great Anchises, far above the rest, With awful wonder fired my youthful breast. I long to join in friendship's holy bands, Our mutual hearts and plight our mutual hands. I first accosted him, I sued, I sought, And with a loving force to Phineus brought. He gave me, when at length constrained to go, A Lysian quiver and a Gnosian bow a vest embroidered glorious to behold, and two rich bridles with their bits of gold, which my son's courses in obedience hold. The league you ask I offer as your right, and when tomorrow's sun reveals the light, with swift supplies you shall be sent away. Now celebrate with us this solemn day, whose holy rites admit no long delay. Honor our annual feast, and take your seat, with friendly welcome at a homely treat. Thus having said, the bowls removed for fear, the youth replaced and soon restored the cheer. On sods of turf he set the soldiers round, 
A maple throne, raised higher from the ground, received the Trojan chief, and o'er the bed a lion's shaggy hide for ornament they spread. The loaves were served in canisters, the wine in bowls, the priest renewed the rites divine. Broiled entrails are their flood, and beef's continued shine. But when the rage of hunger was repressed, thus spoke Evander to his royal guest. These rites, these altars, and this feast, O king, from no vain fears of superstition spring, or blind devotion, or from blinder chance, or heeded zeal, or brutal ignorance. But saved from danger with a grateful sense, the labors of a god we recompense. See from afar yon rock that mates the sky, about whose feet such heaps of rubbish lie, such indigested ruin, bleak and bare, how desart now it stands exposed in air. It was once a robber's den, enclosed around, with living stone and deep beneath the ground, the monster carcass more than half a beast, this hold impervious to the sun possessed. The pavement ever foul with human gore, heads and their mangled members hung the door. Vulcan this plague begot, and like his sire, black clouds he belched and flakes of livid fire. Time long expected eased us of our load, and brought the needful presence of a god. The avenging force of Hercules from Spain arrived in triumph from Geron slain. Thrice livid the giant, and thrice livid in vain, his prize the lowing herds Alcides drove, near Tiber's bank to grace the shady grove. Allured with hope of plunder and intent, by force to rob, by fraud to circumvent, the brutal carcass, as by chance they strayed, four oxen thence, and four fair kind conveyed. And lest the printed footsteps might be seen, he dragged them backwards to his rocky den. The tracks averse a lying notice gave, and led the searcher backward from the cave. Meantime the herdsman hero shifts his place, to find fresh pasture and untrodden grass. The beasts who missed their mates filled all around, with bellowing, and the rocks restored the sound. One heifer who had heard her love complain, roared from the cave and made the project vain. Alcides found the fraud, with rage he shook, and tossed about his head his knotted oak. Swift as the winds or Scythian arrows flight, he clomb with eager haste the aerial height. Then first we saw the monster mend his pace, fear his eyes, and paleness in his face. Confessed the god's approach, trembling he springs, as terror had increased his feet with wings. Nor stayed for stairs, but down the depth he threw, his body on his back the door he drew. The door a rib of living rock with pains, his father hewed it out and bound it with iron chains. He broke the heavy links, the mountains closed, and bars and levers to his foe opposed. The wretch had hardly made his dungeons fast. The fierce avenger came with bounding haste, surveyed the mouth of the forbidden hold, and here and there his raging eyes he rolled. He gnashed his teeth, and thrice he compassed round, with winged speed the circuit of the ground. Thrice at the cavern's mouth he pulled in vain, and panting thrice desisted from his pain. A pointed flinted rock, all bare and black, Grew gibbons from behind the mountain's back, Owls, ravens, all ill omens of the night, Here built their nests, and hither winged their flight. The leaning head hung, threatening o'er the flood, And nodded to the left the hero stud. Adverse with planted feet, and from the right, Tagged at the solid stone with all his might. Thus heaved the fixed foundation of the rock, Gave way, heaven echoed at the rattling shock. Tumbling it choked the flood on either side, The banks leap backward and the streams divide. 
the sky shrunk upward with unusual dread, and trembling Tiber divide beneath his bed, the court of Cacus stands revealed to sight, the cavern glares with new admitted light, so the pent vapors with rumbling sound he from below and rend the hollow ground, a sounding flaw succeeds, and from on high the gods with hate beheld the nether sky. The ghost repine at violated night, and curse the invading sun and sicken at the sight. The graceless monster caught in open day, enclosed and in despair to fly away, howls horrible from underneath and fills his hollow palace with unmanly yells. The hero stands above and from afar, plies him with darts and stones and distant war. He from his nostrils huge mouth expires, black clouds of smoke amidst his father's fires, gathering with each repeated blast the night to make uncertain aim and erring sight. The wrathful god then plunges from above, and where in thickest waves the sparkles draw, their lights and wades through fumes and groups his way, half singed, half stifled, till he grasps his prey. The monster spewing fruitless flames he found, he squeezed his throat, he writhed his neck around, and in a knot his crippled members bound. Then from their sockets tore his burning eyes, rolled on a heap the breathless robber lies. The doors unbarred receive the rushing day, and thorough lights disclose the ravished prey. The bulls redeemed breathe open air again, next by the feet they drag him from his den. The wandering neighborhood with glad surprise behold his shagged breast, his giant size. His mouth that flames no more, and his extinguished eyes, from that auspicious day with rites divine, we worship at the hero's holy shrine. Potitius first ordained these annual vows, as priests we added the Pinarian house, who raised this altar in the sacred shade, where honors ever due for ever shall be paid. For these deserts and this high virtue shown, we warlike youth your heads with garlands crown. Fill high the goblets with a sparkling flood, and with deep draughts invoke our common god. This said, a double wreath ebunder twined, and poplars black and white his temples bind, then brims his ample bowl with like design, the rest invoke the gods with sprinkled wine. Meantime the sun descended from the skies, and the bright evening star began to rise, and now the priest, Potitius at their head, in skins of beasts involved the long procession led held high the flaming tapers in their hands, as custom had prescribed their holy bands. Then with the second course the tables load, and with full chargers offered to the god. The sali sing, and sends his altars round, with saban smoke, their heads with poplar bound. One choir of old, another of the young, to dance and bear the burthen of the song. The lay records the labors and the praise, and all the mortal acts of Hercules. First how the mighty babe, when swathed in bands, the serpent strangled with his infant hands. Then, as in years and matchless force he grew, the Ocalian walls and Trojan overthrew. Besides, a thousand hazards they relate, procured by Juni and Eurystus' hate. Thy hands unconquered hero could subdue, the cloud-born Kentaurs and the monster's crew, nor thy resistless arms the bull withstood, nor the roaring terror of the wood. The triple porter of the Stygian seat with lolling tongue lay fawning at thy feet, and seized with fear forgot his mangled meat, the infernal waters tremble at thy sight. The god no face of danger could affright, no huge Typhus, nor the unnumbered snake, increased with hissing heads in Lerna's lake. 
Hail, Jove's undoubted son, an added grace to heaven and the great author of thy race. Receive the grateful offerings which we pay, and smile propitious on thy solemn day. In numbers thus they sung above the rest, the den and death of Caucus crown the feast. The woods to hollow vales convey the sound, the vales to hills and hills the notes rebound. The rites performed, the cheerful train retire. Betwixt young Pallas and his aged sire, the Trojan passed the city to survey, and pleasing talk beguiled the tedious way. The stranger cast around his curious eyes, new objects viewing still with new surprise, with greedy joy inquires of various things, and acts and monuments of ancient kings. Then thus the founder of the Roman towers, these woods were first the seat of sylvan powers, of nymphs and fauns and salvage men who took their birth from trunks of trees and stubborn oak. Nor laws they knew, nor manners, nor the care of laboring oxen or the shining share, nor arts of gain, nor what they gained to spare. Their exercise, the chase, the running flood, supplied their thirst, the trees supplied their food. Then Saturn came, who fled the power of Jove, robbed of his realms and banished from above. The men dispersed on hills, to towns he brought, and lores ordained and civil customs taught. And Latium called the land where safe he lay, from his unduteous son and his usurping sway. With his mild empire peace and plenty came, and hence the golden times did read their name. A more degenerate and discoloured age succeeded this with avarice and rage. The Ausonians then, and bold Sicanians came, and Saturn's empire often changed the name. Then kings, gigantic Tubris, and the rest, with arbitrary sway the land oppressed. For Tiber's flood was Albula before, till from the tyrant's fate his name it bore. I last arrived driving from my native home by fortune's power and fate's resistless doom. Long tossed on seas I sought this happy land, worn by my mother nymph and called by heaven's command. End of Book 8, Part 1 Book 8, Part 2 of the Aeneid the Aeneid by Publius Virgilius Maro, translated by John Dryden, Book Eight, Arcadian Allies, Part Two. Thus walking on, he spoke and showed the gate, since called Carmental by the Roman state, where stood an altar sacred to the name of old Carmenta, the prophetic dame, who to her son foretold the Aeneian race sublime in fame and Rome's imperial place. Then shows the forest, which in after times, fierce Romulus for perpetrated crimes, a sacred refuge made with this the shrine, where Pan below the rock had rites divine. Then tells of Argus' death, his murdered guest, whose grave and tomb his innocence attest. Thence to steep Tarpeian rock he leads, now roofed with gold, then thatched with homely reeds. A reverent fear, such superstition reigns among the rude, even then possessed the swains. Some god they knew, what god they could not tell, did there amidst the sacred horror dwell. The Arcadian thought him Job, and said they saw the mighty thunderer with majestic ave who took his shield and dealt his bolts around, and scattered tempests on the teeming ground. Then saw two heaps of ruins, once they stood, two stately towns on either side the flood. Saturnius and Jan Nicholas remains, and either place the founder's name retains. Discoursing thus together they'd resort, where poor Evander kept his country court. They viewed the ground of Rome's litigious hall, once oxen load where now the lawyers bawl. 
Then stooping through the narrow gate they pressed, when thus the king bespoke his Trojan guest. Mean as it is this palace and this door, received Alcides then a conqueror. Dare to be poor except our homely food, which feasted him and emulate a god. Then underneath a lowly roof he led the weary prince and laid him on a bed. Then stuffing leaves with hides of bears o'erspread, now night had shed her silver dews around, and with her sable wings embraced the ground. When love's fair goddess, anxious for her son, new tumults racing and new wars begun, couched with her husband in his golden bed, with these alluring words invokes his aid, and that her pleasing speech his mind may move, inspires each accent with its charms of love. While cruel fate conspired with Grecian powers to level with the ground the Trojan towers, I'd ask not aid the unhappy to restore, nor did the succor of thy skill implore, nor urge the labors of my lord in vain, a sinking empire longer to sustain. Though much I owe to Priam's house and more, the dangers of Aeneas did deplore. But now, by Jove's command and fate's decree, his race is doomed to reign in Italy. With humble suit I beg thy needful art, O still propitious power that rules my heart. A mother kneels a suppliant for her son, by Tethys and Aurora thou wert one, to forge impenetrable shields and grace, with fated arms a less illustrious race. Behold what haughty nations are combined against the relics of the Phrygian kind. With fire and sword my people to destroy, and conquer Venus twice in conquering Troy. She said and straight her arms of snowy hue about her unresolving husband threw. Her soft embraces soon infused desire, his bones and marrow sudden warmth inspire. And all the Godhead feels the wanted fire, not half so swift the rattling thunder flies, or forky lightning flash along the skies. The Goddess proud of her successful wiles, and conscious of her form in secret smiles. Then thus the power obnoxious to her charms, panting and half dissolving in her arms. Why seek you reasons for a cause so just, or your own beauties or my love detrust? Long since had you required my helpful hand, the artificer and art you might command, to labor arms for Troy, nor Jove nor fate, confined their empire to so short a date. And if you now desire new wars to wage, my skill I promise and my pains engage. Whatever melting metals can conspire, or breathing bellows, or the forming fire, is freely yours, your anxious fears remove, and think no task is difficult to love. Trembling he spoke, and eager over charms, he snatched the willing goddess to his arms, till in her lap infused he lay possessed of full desire, and sunk to pleasing rest. Now, when the night her middle race had rode, and his first slumber had refreshed the god, the time when early housewives leave the bed, when living embers on the hearth they spread, supply the lamp and call the maids to rise, with yawning mouths and with half-opened eyes, they ply the distaff by the winking light, and to their daily labor add their night. Thus frugally they earn their children's bread, and uncorrupted keep the nuptial bed. Not less concerned, nor at a later hour, rose from his downy couch the forging power. Sacred to Vulcan's name an isle there lay, betwixt Sicilia's coast and Lepare, raised high on smoking rocks and deep below, in hollow caves the fires of Etna glow. The kicklops hear their heavy hammer steel, loud strokes and hissings of tormented steel. 
are heard around the boiling waters roar and smoky flames through fuming tunnels soar hither the father of the fire by night through the brown air precipitates his flight on their eternal anvils here he found the brethren beating and the blows go round a load of pointless thunder now there lies before their hands to ripen for the skies these starts for angry jove they daily cast consumed on mortals with prodigious waste three rays of rhythm rain of fire three more of winged southern winds and cloudy store as many parts the dreadful mixture frame and fears are added and avenging flame inferior ministers for mars repair his broken axle trees and blunted war and send him forth again with furbished arms to wake the lazy war with trumpets loud alarms the rest refresh the scaly snake that fold the shield of pallas and renew their gold full on the crest of gorgon's head they place with eyes that roll in death and with distorted face my sons said vulcan set your task aside your strength and master skill must now be tried arms for a hero forge arms that require your force your speed and all your forming fire he said they set their former work aside and their new toils with eager haste divide a flood of molten silver brass and gold and deadly steel in the large furnace rolled of this their artful hands a shield prepare alone sufficient to sustain the war seven orbs within a spacious round they close one stirs the fire and one the bellows blows the hissing steel is in the smithy drowned the grot with beaten anvils groans around by turns their arms advance in equal time by turns their hands descend and hammers chime they turn the glowing mass with crooked tongues the fairy work proceeds with rustic songs while at the limnian gods command they urge their labors thus and ply the aeolian forge the cheerful morn salutes evander's eyes and songs of chirping birds invite to rise he leaves his lowly bed his buskins meet above his ankles sandals sheath his feet he sets his trusty sword upon his side and o'er his shoulder throws a panther's hide to menial dogs before the master pressed thus clad and guarded thus he seeks his kingly guest mindful of promised aid he mends his pace but meets aeneas in the middle space young pallas did his father's steps attend and true achates waited on his friend they join their hands a secret seat they choose the arcadian first their former talk renews undaunted prince i never can believe the trojan empire lost while you survive command the assistance of a faithful friend but feeble are the succors i can send our narrow kingdom here the tiber bounds that other side the latian state surrounds insults our walls and wastes our fruitful grounds but mighty nations i prepare to join their arms with yours and aid your just design you come as by your better genius sent and fortune seems to favor your intent not far from hence there stands a hilly town of ancient buildings and of high renown torn from the tuscans by the lydian race who gave the name of Cary to the place once agelina called it flourished long in pride of wealth and warlike people strong till cursed mesentius in a fatal hour assumed the crown with arbitrary power what words can paint those execrable times the subjects sufferings and the tyrants crimes that blood those murders o ye gods replace on his own head and on his impious race the living and the dead at his command were coupled face to face 
and hand to hand, till choked with stench in loathed embraces tied, the lingering wretches pined away and died. Thus plunged in ills and meditating more, the people's patience tired no longer bore. The raging monster, but with arms beset, his house and vengeance and destruction threat. They fire his place, while the flame ascends, they force his guards and execute his friends. He cleaves the crowd, and favored by the night, to Turnus friendly court directs his flight. By just revenge the Tuscans set on fire, with arms their king to punishment require. Their numerous troops now mustered on the strand, my counsel shall submit to your command. Their navy swarms upon the coasts, they cry, to hoist their anchors, but the gods deny. An ancient augur, skilled in future fate, with these foreboding words restrains their hate. Ye brave in arms, ye Lydian blood, the flower of Tuscan youth and choice of all their power, whom just revenge against Mesentius arms to seek your tyrant's death by lawful arms. Know this, no native of our land may lead, this powerful people seek a foreign head. Out with these words in camps they still abide, and wait with longing looks their promised guide. Tarkon, the Tuscan chief, to me has sent, their crown and every regal ornament. The people join their own with his desire, and all my conduct as their king require. But the chill blood that creeps within my veins, and age and listless limbs unfit for pains, and a soul conscious of its own decay, have forced me to refuse imperial sway. My palace were more fit to mount the throne, and should, but he is a Sabine mother's son, and half a native, but in you combine a manly vigor and a foreign line. Where fate and smiling fortune shew the way, pursue the ready path to sovereign sway. The staff of my declining days, my son, shall make your good or ill success his own. In fighting fields from you shall learn to dare, and serve the hard apprenticeship of war. Your matchless courage and your conduct view, and early shall begin to admire and copy you. Besides two hundred horse he shall command, though few a warlike and well-chosen band. These in my name are listed, and my son, as many more has added in his own. Scarce had he said, Achates and his guest, with downcast eyes their silent grief expressed, who short of succors and in deep despair shook at the dismal prospect of the war. But his bright mother from a breaking cloud, to cheer her issue thundered thrice aloud. Thrice forky lightning flashed along the sky, and Tyrrhena trumpets thrice were heard on high. Then gazing up, repeated peals they hear, and in a heaven serene, refulgent arms appear, reddening the skies and glittering all around. The tempered metals clash and yield a silver sound. The rest stood trembling, struck with ave divine, Aeneas only conscious to the sign. Presaged the event and joyful viewed above the accomplished promise of the queen of love. Then to the Arcadian king, this prodigy, dismiss your fear, belongs alone to me. Heaven calls me to the war, the expected sign is given of promised aid and arms divine. My goddess mother, whose indulgent care foresaw the dangers of the growing war, this omen gave when bright Vulcanian arms, fated from force of steel by Stygian charms, suspended shone on high, she then foreshowed approaching fights and fields to float in blood. Turnus shall dearly pay for faith forsworn, and corpse and swords and shields on Tiber borne shall choke his flood, 
thou sound the loud alarms, and Latian troops prepare your perjured arms. He said, and rising from his homely throne, the solemn rites of Hercules begun, and on his altars waked the sleeping fires, then cheerful to his household gods retires, their offers chosen sheep, the Arcadian king, and Trojan youth the same oblation spring. Next of his men and ships he makes review, draws out the best and ablest of the crew. Down with the falling stream the refuse run, to raise with joyful news his drooping son. Steeds are prepared to mount the Trojan band, who wait their leader to the Tyrrhene land. A sprightly courser fairer than the rest, the king himself presents his royal guest. A lion's hide his back and limbs enfold, precious with studded work and paws of gold. Fame through the little city spreads aloud, the intended march amid the fearful crowd. The matrons beat their breasts, dissolve in tears, and double their devotion in their fears. The war at hand appears with more affright, and rises every moment to the sight. Then old Evander, with a close embrace, strained his departing friend, and tears overflow his face. Would heaven, said he, my strength and youth recall, such as I was beneath Prenestus wall. Then, when I made the foremost foes retire, and set whole heaps of conquered shields on fire, when Herilus in single fight I slew, whom with three lives Feronia did endue, and thrice I sent him to the Stygian shore, till the last ebbing soul returned no more. Such, if I stood renewed, not these alarms, nor death should rend me from my palace's arms, nor proud Mesentius thus unpunished boast, his rapes and murders on the Tuscan coast. Ye gods and mighty Jove, in pity bring relief and hear a father and a king if fate and you reserve these eyes to see my son return with peace and victory if the loved boy shall bless his father's sight if we shall meet again with more delight then draw my life in length let me sustain in hopes of his embrace the worst of pain but if your hard decrees, which, oh, I dread, have doomed to death his undeserving head, this, oh, this very moment let me die, while hopes and fears in equal balance lie. While yet possessed of all his youthful charms, I strain him close within these aged arms. Before that fatal news my soul shall wound, he said, and swooning sunk upon the ground. His servants bore him off and softly laid his languished limbs upon his homely bed. The horsemen march, the gates are open wide, Aeneas at their head, Achates by his side. Next these the Trojan leaders rode along, last follows in the rear the Arcadian throng. Young Pallas shone conspicuous o'er the rest, gilded his arms, embroidered was his vest. So from the seas exerts his radiant head, the star by whom the lights of heaven are led, shakes from his rosy locks the pearly dews, dispels the darkness and the day renews. The trembling wives the walls and turrets crowd, and follow with their eyes the dusty cloud, which winds dispersed by fits and shew from far the blaze of arms and shields and shining war. The troops drawn up in beautifully array O'er hearthy plains pursue the ready way. Repeated peals of shouts are heard around, The neighing courses answer to the sound, And shake with horny hoofs the solid ground. A greenswood shade, for long religion known, Stands by the streams that wash the Tuscan town. Incompassed round with gloomy hills above, which add a holy horror to the grow. The first inhabitants of Grecian blood, that sacred forest to Silvanus vowed, the guardian of their flocks and fields, 
and pay their due a devotions on his annual day. Not far from hence, along the river's side, in tents secure the Tuscan troops abide. By Tarkon led, now from a rising ground, Aeneas cast his wandering eyes around, and all the Tyrrhene army had in sight, stretched on the spacious plain from left to right, Thither his warlike train the Trojan led, refreshed his men, and wearied horses fed. Meantime the mother goddess, crowned with charms, breaks through the clouds and brings the fated arms. Within a winding vale she finds her son, on the cool river's banks retired alone. She shews her heavenly form without disguise, and gives herself to his desiring eyes. Behold, she said, performed in every part, my promise made and Vulcan's laboured art. Now seek, secure, the Latian enemy, and the haughty Turnus to the fields defy. She said, and having first a son embraced, the radiant arms beneath an oak she placed. Proud of the gift, he rolled his greedy sight around the work and gazed with vast delight. He lifts, he turns, he poises and admires the crested helm that vomits radiant fires. His hands the fatal sword and corslet hold, one keen with tempered steel, one stiff with gold. Both ample, flaming both, and beamy bright, so shines a cloud when edged with adverse light. He shakes the pointed spear and longs to try the plated cushions on his manly thigh, but most admires the shield's mysterious mould and Roman triumphs rising on the gold. For these embossed the heavenly smith had wrought, not in the rolls of future fate untaught. The wars in order and the race divine of warriors issuing from the Julian line. The cave of Mars was dressed with mossy greens. There, by the wolf, were laid the martial twins. Intrepid on her swelling dugs they hung. The foster dam lolled out her fawning tongue. They sucked secure while bending back her head. She licked their tender limbs and formed them as they fed. Not far from thence new Rome appears with games, projected for the rape of Sabine dames. The pit resounds with shrieks, a war succeeds, for breach of public faith and unexampled deeds. Here, for revenge, the Sabine troops contend, the Romans there with arms the prey defend. Wearied with tedious war, at length they cease, and both the kings and kingdoms plight the peace. The friendly chiefs before Jove's altar stand, both armed with each a charger in his hand. A fatted sow for sacrifice is led, with imprecations on the perjured head. Near this the traitor Metheus stretched between, for fiery steeds is dragged along the green. By Tullus' doom the brambles drink his blood, and his thorn limbs are left the vulture's food. There Porcina to Rome proud Tarquin brings, and would by force restore the banished kings. One tyrant for his fellow tyrant fights, the Roman youth assert their native rights. Before the town the Tuscan army lies, to win by famine or by fraud surprise. The king half threatening, half disdaining stood, while cockles broke the bridge and stemmed the flood. The captive maids there tempt the raging tide, scraped from their chains with Cloelia for their guide. High on a rock heroic Manlius stood to guard the temple and the temple's god. Then Rome was poor, and there you might behold the palace thatched with straw, now roofed with gold. The silver goose before the shining gate there flew, and by her cackle saved the state. She told the Gauls approach, the approaching Gauls, obscure in night ascend and seize the walls. The gold assembled well their yellow hair, and golden chains on their white necks they wear. Gold are their vests, long alpine spears they wield, and their left arm sustains a length 
of shield. Hard by the leaping Salian priests advance, and naked through the streets the mad Luperci dance. In caps of wool the targets dropped from heaven, her modest matrons in soft litters driven. To pay their vows in solemn pomp appear, and odorous gums in their chaste hands they bear. Far hence removed the Stygian seats are seen, pains of the damned and punished Cataline, hung on a rock the traitor and around, the furies hissing from the nether ground. Apart from these, the happy souls he draws, and Cato's holy ghost dispensing laws. Betwixt the quarters flows a golden sea, but foaming surges there in silver play. The dancing dolphins with their tails divide the glittering waves and cut the precious tide. Amid the main two mighty fleets engage, their brazen beaks opposed with equal rage. Axiom surveys the well-disputed prize, Levcata's watery plain with foamy billows fries. Young Caesar on the stern in armor bright, here leads the Roman and their gods to fight. His beamy temples shoot their flames afar, and over his head is hung the Julian star. Agrippa seconds him with prosperous gales, and with propitious gods his foes assails. A naval crown that binds his manly brows, the happy fortune of the fight foreshows. Ranged on the line of post, Antonio springs, barbarian aids and troops of eastern kings. The Arabian near, and Bactrians from afar, of tongues discordant and a mingled war. And rich in gaudy robes amidst the strife, his ill fate follows him, the Egyptian wife. Moving they fight with oars and forky prows, the froth is gathered and the water glows. It seems as if the Cyclades again were rooted up and justled in the main. Or floating mountains, floating mountains meet, such is the fierce encounter of the fleet. Fireballs are thrown and pointed javelins fly, the fields of Neptune take the purple dye. The queen herself, amidst the loud alarms, with the cymbals tossed her fainting soldiers warms. Fool as she was, who had not yet divined her cruel fate, nor saw the snakes behind. Her country gods, the monsters of the sky, great Neptune, Pallas, and love's queen defy. The dog Anubis barks, but barks in vain, nor longer dares oppose the ethereal train. Mars in the middle of the shining shield is graved and strides along the liquid field. The dear results from heaven with swift descent, and discord dyed in blood with garments rent, divides the priests her steps Bellona treads, and shakes her iron rod above their heads. This scene Apollo from his Axian height pours down his arrows at whose winged flight the trembling Indians and Egyptians yield. And soft Sabines quit the water field, the fatal mistress hoists her silken sails, and shrinking from the fight invokes the gales. Aghast she looks, and heaves her breast for breath, panting and pale with fear of future death. The god had figured her as striving along, by winds and waves and scudding through the throng. Just opposite, sad Nilus opens wide his arms and ample bosom to the tide, and spreads his mantle over the winding coast, in which he wraps his queen and hides the flying host. The victor to the gods his thanks expressed, and Rome triumphant with his presence blessed. Three hundred temples in the town he placed, with spoils and altars every temple graced. Three shining nights and three succeeding days, the fields resound with shouts, the streets with praise, the domes with songs, the theatres with plays. All altars flame before each altar lies, drenched in his gore the destined sacrifice. Great Caesar sits sublime upon his throne, before Apollo's porch of Parian stone. 
accepts the presence vowed for victory, and hangs the monumental crowns on high. Vast crowds of vanquished nations march along, various in arms, in habit, and in tongue. Here Malsibur assigns the proper place for Carians and the ungirt Numidian race. Then ranks the Trakians in the second row, with Scythians expert in the dart and bow. And here the tamed Euphrates humbly glides, and there the Rhine submits her swelling tides. And proud Araxas, whom no bridge could bind, the Danes' unconquered offspring march behind, and Morini the last of humankind. These figures on the shield divinely wrought, by Vulcan labored and by Venus brought, with joy and wonder fill the hero's thought. Unknown the names, he yet admires the grace, and bears aloft the fame and fortune of his race. End of Book 8 Book 9, Part 1 of the Aeneid While these affairs in distant places pass it, the various Irish Juno sends with haste to find bold Turnus, who with anxious thought the secret shade of his great-grandsire sought. Retired alone, she found the daring man, and oped her rosy lips, and thus began. What none of all the gods could grant thy vows, that Turnus this auspicious day bestows. Aeneas, gone to seek the Arcadian prince, has left the Trojan camp without defence, and short of succors there employs his pains, in parts remote to raise the Tuscan swains. Now snatch an hour that favors thy designs, unite thy forces, and attack their lines. This said, on equal wings she poised her weight, and formed a radiant rainbow in her flight. The Daunian hero lifts his hand's eyes, and thus invokes the goddess as she flies. Iris, the grace of heaven, what power divine, has sent thee down through dusky clouds to shine? See, they divide, immortal day appears, and glittering planets dancing in their spheres. With joy these happy omens I obey, and follow to the war the god that leads the way. Thus having said, as by the brook he stood, he scooped the water from the crystal flood. Then with his hands the drops to heaven he throws, and loads the powers above with offered woes. Now march the bold confederates through the plain, well horsed, well clad, a rich and shining train. Mesopus leads the van, and in the rear the sons of Tyrius in bright arms appear. In the main battle, with his flaming crest, the mighty Turnus towers above the rest. Silent they move majestically slow, like ebbing Nile or Ganges in his flow. The Trojans view the dusty cloud from far, and the dark menace of the distant war. Caicus from the rampire saw it rise, blackening the fields and thickening through the skies. Then to his fellows thus aloud he calls, What rolling clouds, my friends, approach the walls? Arm, arm, and man the works, prepare your spears, And pointed darts the Latian host appears. Thus warned, they shut their gates, with shouts ascend, The bulwarks and secure their foes attend. For their wise general, with foreseeing care, Had charged them not to tempt the doubtful war, Nor, though provoked in open fields advance, But close within their lines attend their chance. Unwilling, they yet they keep the strict command, And sorely await in arms the hostile band. The fiery Turnus flew before the rest, A piebald steed of Trachian strain he pressed. His helm of massy gold and crimson was his crest, with twenty horse to second his designs. An unexpected foe he faced the lines. Is there, he said in arms, who bravely dare his leader honor and his danger share? Then spurring on, his brandished dart he threw, in sign of war, applauding shouts ensure. 
Amazed to find a dastard race that run behind the rampires and the battle shun, he rides around the camp with rolling eyes and stops at every post and every passage tries. So roams the nightly wolf about the fold, wet with descending showers and stiff with cold. He howls for hunger and he grins for pain. His gnashing teeth are exercised in vain. An impotent of anger finds no way in his distended paws to grasp the prey. The mothers listen, but the bleeding lambs securely swig the dug beneath the dams. Thus rangers eager turn us o'er the plain, sharp with desire and furious with disdain. So veys each passage with a piercing sight to force his foes in equal field to fight. Thus, while he gazes round at length, he spies, where fenced with strong redoubts their navy lies. Close underneath the walls, the washing tide secures from all approach this weaker side. He takes the wished occasion, fills his hand with ready fires, and shakes a flaming brand. Urged by his presence, every soul is warmed, and every hand with kindled furs is armed. From the furred pines the scattering sparkles fly, Fat vapors mixed with flames involve the sky. What power, O Muses, could avert the flame, Which threatened in the fleet the Trojan name? Tell, for the fact through length of time obscure, Is hard to faith, yet shall the fame endure. Tis said that when the chief prepared his flight, And fell his timber from Mount Ida's height, the grand am goddess then approached her son, and with a mother's majesty begun. Grant me, she said, the sole request I bring, since conquered heaven has owned you for its king. On Ida's brows for ages past there stood, with firs and maples filled a shady wood, and on the summit rose a sacred grove, where I was worshipped with religious love. Those woods that wholly grew my long delight, I gave the Trojan prince to speed his flight. Now filled with fear on their behalf I come, let neither winds o'erset nor waves in tomb, the floating forests of the sacred pine, but let it be their safety to be mine. Then thus replied her awful son, who rolls the radiant stars and heaven and earth controls. How dare you, mother, endless state demand, For vessels moulded by a mortal hand? What then is fate? Shall bold Aeneas ride, Of safety certain on the uncertain tide? Yet what I can I grant, When wafted o'er, The chief is landed on the Latian shore. Whatever ships escape the raging storms, At my command shall change their fading forms, To nymphs divine, and plough the watery way, Like Dotis and the daughters of the sea. To seal the sacred vow, by Styx he swore, The lake of liquid pitch, the dreary shore, And Phlegaton's innavigable flood, And the black regions of his brother God. He said, and shook the skies with his imperial nod. And now, at length, the numbered hours were come, prefixed by fate's irrevocable doom, when the great mother of the gods was free to save her ships and finish Jove's decree. First from the quarter of the morn there sprung a light that signed the heavens and shots along. Then from a cloud fringed round with golden fires were timbrels heard and very Cynthian choirs. And last a voice with more than mortal sounds, both hosts in armed opposed with equal horror wounds. O Trojan race, your needless aid forbear, and know my ships are my peculiar care. With greater ease the bold Rutulian may, with hissing brands attempt to burn the sea. Then singe my sacred pines, but you may charge, loosed from your crooked anchor's launch at large. Exalted each a nymph, forsake the sand, and swim the seas at Sibylus' command. No sooner had the goddess ceased to speak, when, lo, the obedient ships their halsers break. 
and strange to tell, like dolphins in the main, they plunge their prows, and dive and spring again, as many beauteous maids the billows sweep, as rode before tall vessels on the deep. The foes, surprised with wonder, stood aghast. Mesalpus curb his fiery courser's haste. Old Tiber roared, and raising up his head, called back his waters to their oozy bed. Turnus alone undaunted bore the shock, and with these words his trembling troops bespoke. These monsters for the Trojans' fate are meant, and are by Jove for black presages sent. He takes the coward's last relief away, for fly they cannot and constrained to stay, must yield unfought a base inglorious prey. The liquid half of all the globe is lost, heaven shuts the seas, and we secure the coast. Theirs is no more than that small spot of ground, which myriads of our martial men surround. Their fates I fear not, or vain oracles, it was given to Venus they should cross the seas, and land secure upon the Latian plains, their promised hour is past, and mine remains, tis in the fate of Turnus to destroy, with sword and fire, the faithless race of Troy, shall such affronts as these alone inflame, the Grecian brothers and the Grecian name, my cause and theirs is one, a fatal strife, and final ruin for a ravished wife. Was not enough that punished for the crime, they fell, but will they fall a second time? One would have thought they paid enough before, to curse the costly sex and durst offend no more. Can they securely trust their feeble wall, a slight partition, a thin interval? Betwixt their fate and them when Troy though built, By hands divine yet perished by their guilt, Lend me for once, my friends, your valiant hands, To force from out their lines these dastard bands, Less than a thousand ships will end this war, Nor Vulcan needs his fated arms prepare. Let all the Tuscans, all the Archaeans join, Nor these nor those shall frustrate my design. Let them not fear the treasons of the night, the robbed palladium, the pretended flight. Our onset shall be made in the open light. No wooden engine shall their town betray. Fires they shall have around, but fires by day. No Grecian babes before their camp appear, whom Hector's arms detain to the tenth tardy year. Now, since the sun is rolling to the west, give we the silent night to needful rest. Refresh your bodies and your arms prepare. The morn shall end the small remains of wear. The post of honor to Messapus falls, To keep the nightly guards to watch the walls, To pitch the fires at distances around, And close the Trojans in their scanty ground. Twice seven Rutulian captains ready stand, And twice seven hundred horse these chiefs command. All clad in shining arms the works invest, Each with a radiant helm and waving crest. Stretched at their length they press the grassy ground, They laugh, they sing, the jolly bowls go round. With lights and cheerful fires renew the day, And pass the wakeful night in feasts and play. The Trojans from above their foes beheld, And with armed legions all the rampires filled, Seized with a fright, their gates they first explore, Join works to works with bridges tower to tower. Thus all things needful for defense abound, Menestus and brave Serestus walk the round, Commissioned by their absent prince to share The common danger and divide the care. The soldiers draw their lots, and as they fall, By turns relieve each other on the wall. Nigh where the foes their utmost guards advance, To watch the gate was warlike Nisus' chance. His father Hyrtacus of noble blood, His mother was a huntress on the wood, And sent him to the wars, well could he bear His lance in fight, and dart the flying spear. But better skilled unerring shafts to send, Beside him stood every Aulus his friend, Evrialus, then whom the Trojan host, No fairer face or sweeter air could boast, 
Scarce had the down to shade his cheeks begun. One was their care, and their delight was one. One common hazard in the war they shared, and now were both by choice upon the guard. Then Nisus thus, or do the gods inspire this warmth, or make we gods of our desire? A generous ardor boils within my breast, eager of action, enemy to rest. This urges me to fight, and fires my mind, to leave a memorable name behind. Thou seest the foe secure, how faintly shine, their scattered fires, the most, in sleep supine. Along the ground an easy conquest lie, the wakeful few of fuming flagon ply. All hashed around, now hear what I revolve, a thought unripe and scarcely yet resolved. Our absent prince, both camp and council mourn, by message both would hasten his return. If they confer what I demand on thee, for fame is recompense enough for me. Methinks beneath yon hill I have espied a way that safely will my passage guide. Every Aulus stood listening while he spoke, with love of praise and noble envy struck. Then to his ardent friend exposed his mind, all this alone, and leaving me behind. Am I unworthy, Nisus, to be joined? Thinkest thou I can share of glory yield, or send thee unassisted to the field? Not so, my father taught my childhood arms, born in a siege and bred among alarms. Nor is my youth unworthy of my friend, nor of the heaven-born hero I attend. The thing called life with ease I can disclaim, and think it oversold, to purchase frame. Then Nisus thus, Alas, thy tender years Would minister new matter to my fears. So may the gods, Who view this friendly strife, Restore me to thy loved embrace with life. Condemned to pay my vows, As sure I trust, This thy request is cruel and unjust. But if some chance as many chances are, And doubtful hazards in the deeds of war, If one should reach my head, there let it fall, and spare thy life, I would not perish all. Thy bloomy youth deserves a longer day, live thou to mourn thy love's unhappy fate, to bear my mangled body from the foe, or buy it back and funeral rites bestow. Or if hard fortune shall those dues deny, thou canst at least an empty tomb supply. O oh, let not me the widow's tears renew, nor let a mother's curse my name pursue. Thy pious parents, who for love of thee forsook the coast of friendly Sicily, her age committing to the seas and wind, when every weary matron stayed behind, to this every Aulus, you plead in vain, and but protract the course you cannot gain. No more delays but haste, with that he wakes, the nodding watch each of his office takes. The guard relieved, the generous couple went to find the council at the royal tent. All creatures else forgot their daily care, and sleep the common gift of nature share. Except the Trojan peers who wakeful sate in nightly council for the endangered state. They vote a message to their absent chief, shew their distress, and beg a swift relief. Amid the camp a silent seat they chose, remote from clamor and secure from foes. On their left arms their ample shields they bear, the right reclined upon the bending spear. Now Nisus and his friend approach the guard, and beg admission eager to be heard. The affair important not to be deferred, Ascanius bids them be conducted in, ordering the more experienced to begin. Then Nisus thus, Ye fathers, lend your ears, nor judge our bold attempt beyond our years. The foe, securely drenched in sleep and wine, neglect their watch, the fires but thinly shine. And where the smoke in cloudy vapors flies, cowering the plain and curling to the skies, betwixt two paths, which at the gate divide, close by the sea, a passage we have spied, which will our way to great Aeneas guide, Expect each hour to see him safe again, Loaded with spoils of foes in battle slain. 
Snatch we the lucky minute while we may, nor can we be mistaken in the way. For hunting in the vale we both have seen the rising turrets and the stream between, and know the winding course with every ford. He ceased, and old Aletus took the word. Our country gods, in whom our trust we place, will yet from ruin save the Trojan race. While we behold such dauntless worth appear, in dawning youth and souls so void of fear. Then into tears of joy the father broke, each in his longing arms by turns he took, panted and paused, and thus again he spoke, Ye brave young men, what equal gifts can we, in recompense of such desert decree? The great is sure, and best you can receive, the gods and your own conscious worth will give. The rest our grateful general will bestow, and young Ascanius till his manhood owe. And I, whose welfare in my father lies, Ascanius adds, by the great deities, by my dear country, by my household gods, by hoary Vestas rites and dark abouts, adjure you both, on you my fortune stands, and that and my faith I ply into your hands. Make me but happy in his safe return, whose wanted presence I can only mourn. Your common gift shall two large goblets be, of silver wrought with curious imagery, and high embossed, which, when old Priam reigned, my conquering sire at sacked Arisiba gained, and more, two tripods cast in antique mould, with two great talents of the finest gold, beside a costly bowl engraved with art, which Dido gave when first she gave her heart. But if in conquered Italy we reign, when spoils by lot the victor shall obtain, thou sawest the courser by proud Turnus pressed, that Nisus and his arms and nodding crest, and shield from chance exempt, shall be thy share. Twelve laboring slaves, twelve handmaids young and fair, all clad in rich attire, and trained with care. And last, a Latian field with fruitful plains, and a large portion of the king's domains. But thou, whose years are more to mine allied, no fate my vowed affection shall divide. From thee, heroic youth, be fully mine, take full possession, all my soul is thine. One faith, one fame, one fate shall both attend, my life's companion and my bosom friend. My peace shall be committed to thy care, and to thy conduct my concerns in wear. Then thus the young Evrialus replied, Whatever fortune, good or bad, betide, the same shall be my age as now my youth. No time shall find me wanting to my truth. This only from your goodness let me gain, and this ungranted all rewards are vain. Of Priam's royal race my mother came, and sure the best that ever bore the name, whom neither Troy nor Sicily could hold, from me departing, but o'erspent and old. My fate she followed, ignorant of this, Whatever danger, neither parting kiss, nor Pio's blessing taken, her I leave, and in this only act of all my life deceive. By this right hand and conscious night I swear, my soul so sad a farewell could not bear. Be you her comfort, fill my vacant place, permit me to presume so great a grace, support her age, forsaken and distressed, that hope alone will fortify my breast. Against the worst of fortunes and of fears, he said, the moved assistance melt in tears. Then thus Ascanius wonderstruck to see that image of his filial piety. So great beginnings, in so green an age, exact the faith which I again engage. Thy mother all the dues shall justly claim, craves I had, and only want the name. Whatever event thy bold attempt shall have, tis merit to have borne a son so brave. Now by my head a sacred oath I swear, my father used it, what returning here, crowned with success I for thyself prepare, that if thou fail shall thy loved mother share. He said, and weeping while he spoke the word, from his broad belt he drew a shining sword, magnificent with gold, 
Decaun made, and in an ivory scabbard sheathed the blade. This was his gift, great Menestus gave his friend, a lion's hide his body to defend. And good Aletus furnished him beside with his own trusty helm of temper tried. Thus armed they went, the noble Trojans wait, their issuing forth and follow to the gate. With prayers and vows above the rest appears, Ascanius manly far beyond his years, and messages committed to their care, which all in winds were lost and flitting air. The trenches first they passed and took their way, where their proud foes in pitched pavilions lay. To many fatal ere themselves were slain, they found the careless host dispersed upon the plain, who gorged and drunk with wine supinely snore, unharnessed chariots stand along the shore. Amidst the wheels and reins the goblets by, a medley of debauch and war they lie. Observing Nisus showed his friend the sight, behold a conquest gained without a fight, Occasion offers, and I stand prepared. There lies our way, be thou upon the guard, and look around while I securely go, and you a passage through the sleeping foe. Softly he spoke, then striding took his way, with his drawn sword, where haughty Ramnus lay, his head raised high on tapestry beneath, and heaving from his breast he drew his breath. A king and prophet by King Turnus loved, but fate by prescience cannot be remote. Him and his sleeping slaves he slew than spies, where Remus with his rich retinue lies. His armor-bearer first and next he kills, his charioteer entrenched betwixt the wheels, and his loved horses last invades their lord. Full on his neck he drives the fatal sword. The gasping head flies off, a purple flood flows from the trunk, that welters in the blood, which by the spurning heels dispersed around, the bed besprinkles and bedews the ground. Lamus the bold, and Lamyrus the strong, he slew, and then Serranus fair and young. From dice and wine the youth retired to rest, and puffed the fumy god from out his breast. Even then he dreamt of drink and lucky play, more lucky had it lasted till the day. The famished lion thus, with hunger bold, o'erleaps the fences of the nightly fold, and tears the peaceful flocks with silent awe. Trembling they lie and pant beneath his pow. Nor with less rage Evrialis employs the wrathful sword, or fewer foes destroys. But on the noble crowd his fury flew. He Fadus, Hebesus, and Rhoetus slew. Oppressed with heavy sleep the former fell, but Ruetus wakeful and observing all, behind a spacious jar he slinked for fear, the fatal iron found and reached him there. For as he rose it pierced his naked side, and reeking thence returned in crimson dyed. The wound pours out a stream of wine and blood, the purple soul comes floating in the flood. Now, where Messapus quartered they arrive, the fires were fainting there and just alive. The warrior horses tied in order, fed, Nisus observed the discipline and said, Our eager thirst of blood may both betray, and see the scattered streaks of dawning day. Foe to nocturnal thefts, no more, my friend, here let our glutted execution end. A lane through slaughtered bodies we have made, the bold Ibrialus, though loath, obeyed. Of arms and arras and of plate they find a precious load, but these they leave behind. Yet fond of gaudy spoils the boy would stay to make the rich caparison his prey, which on the steed of conquered Ramnus lay. Nor did his eyes less longingly behold the girdle belt with nails of burnished gold. This present Sedicus the rich bestowed, on Remulus when friendship first they vowed, and absent joined in hospital ties, he dying to his heir bequeathed the prize, till by the conquering Ardian troops oppressed, he fell, and they the glorious gift possessed. These glittering spoils now made the victors gain, he to his body suits, but suits in vain. Messapus' helm he finds among the rest, 
and laces on, and wears the waving crest. Proud of their conquest, prouder of their prey, they leave the camp and take the ready way. End of Book Nine, Part One Book Nine, Part Two of the Aeneid The Aeneid by Publius Virgilius Maro Translated by John Dryden Book Nine A Night Surty, A Day Assault, Part Two But far they had not passed before they spied Three hundred horse with volsons for their guide the queen a legion to king turnus sent but the swift horse the slower foot prevent and now advancing sought the leader's tent they saw the pair for throw the doubtful shade his shining helm evrialis betrayed on which the moon with full reflection played tis not for naught cried volsons from the crowd these men go there then raised his voice aloud Stand, stand, why thus in arms, and whither bent? From whence to whom, and on what errand sent? Silent they scud away, and haste their flight, To neighboring woods, and trust themselves to night. The speedy horse all passages belay, And spur their smoking steeds to cross their way, And watch each entrance of the winding wood, Black was the forest, thick, with speech it stood, horrid with fern and intricate with thorn. Few paths of human feet or tracks of beasts were worn. The darkness of the shades his heavy prey, and fear misled the younger from his way. But Nisus hit the turns with happier haste, and thoughtless of his friend the forest passed, and Alban plains from Alba's name so called where King Latinus then his oxen stalled, till turning at the length he stood his ground, and missed his friend, and cast his eyes around. Ah, wretch, he cried, where have I left behind? The unhappy youth, where shall I hope to find? Or what way take? Again he ventures back, and treads the mazes of his former track. He winds the wood, and listening hears the noise, of tramping courses and the rider's voice. The sound approached, and suddenly he viewed the foes enclosing and his friend pursued, forelaid and taken while he strove in vain the shelter of the friendly shades to gain. What should he next attempt? What arms employ? What fruitless force to free the captive boy? Or desperate should he rush and lose his life? with odds suppressed in such unequal strife. Resolved at length, his pointed spear he shook, and casting on the moon a mournful look. Guardian of groves and goddess of the night, fair queen, he said, direct my dart aright. If ever my pious father, for my sake, did grateful offerings on thy altars make, or I increased them with my sylvan toils, and hung thy holy roofs with savage spoils. Give me to scatter these. Then from his ear he poised and aimed, and launched the trembling spear, the deadly weapon hissing from the grove, impetuous on the back of Sulmo drove, pierced his thin armor, drank his vital blood, and in his body left the broken. He staggers round, his eyeballs roll in death, and with short sobs he gasps away his breath. All stand amazed, a second javelin flies, with equal strength, and quivers through the skies. This through thy temples Targos forced the way, and in the brain-pan warmly buried lay. Fierce Volsons foams with rage, and gazing round, descried not him who gave the fatal wound, nor knew to fix revenge, but thou, he cries, shalt pay for both, and at the prisoner flies. With his drawn sword, then struck with deep despair, that cruel sight the lover could not bear. But from his covert rushed in open view, and sent his voice before him as he flew. Me, me, he cried, turn all your swords alone, on me the fact confessed, the fault my own. 
he neither could nor durst the guiltless youth ye moan and stars bear witness to the truth his only crime if friendship can offend is too much love to this unhappy friend too late he speaks the sword which fury guides driven with full forth had pierced his tender sides down fell the beauteous youth the yawning wound gushed out a purple stream and stained the ground his snowy neck reclines upon his breast like a fair flower by the keen share oppressed like a white poppy sinking on the plain whose heavy head is overcharged with rain despair and rage and vengeance justly vowed drove nisus headlong on the hostile crowd volsens he seeks on him alone he bends borne back and bored by his surrounding friends onward he pressed and kept him still in sight then whirled aloft his sword with all his might the unerring steel descended while he spoke peered his wide mouth and through his weson broke dying he slew and staggering on the plain with swimming eyes he sought his lover slain then quiet on his bleeding bosom fell content in death to be revenged so well o oh, happy friends for if my verse can give immortal life your fame shall ever live fixed as the capital's foundation lies and spread wherever the roman eagle flies the conquering party first divide the prey then their slain leader to the camp convey with wonder as they went the troops were filled to see such numbers whom so few had killed serranus ramnus and the rest they found vast crowds the dying and the dead surround and the yet reeking blood o'erflows the ground or knew the helmet which mesopus lost but mourned a purchase that so dear had cost now rose the ruddy morn from teton's bed and with the dawn of day the skies o'erspread nor long the sun his daily course withheld but added colours to the world revealed when earthly turnus wakening with the light all clad in armour calls his troops to fight his martial men with fierce harangue he fired and his own ardor in their souls inspired this done to give new terrors to his foes the heads of nisus and his friends he shows raised high on pointed spears a ghastly sight loud peals of shouts ensue and barbarous delight meantime the trojans run where danger calls they line their trenches and they man their walls in front extended to the left they stood safe was the right surrounded by the flood but casting from their towers a frightful view they saw the faces which too well they knew though then disguised in death and smeared all over with filth obscene and dropping putrid gore soon hasty fame through the sad city bears the mournful messages to the mother's ears an icy cold benumbs her limbs she shakes her cheeks the blood her hand the web forsakes she runs the rampires round amidst the war nor fears the flying darts she rends her hair and fills with loud laments the liquid air thus then my loved Evrialus appears thus looks the prop my declining years was on this face my famished eyes i fed oh how unlike the living is the dead and couldst thou leave me cruel thus alone not one kind kiss from a departing son no look no last adieu before he went an ill-boding hour to slaughter sent cold on the ground and pressing foreign clay to latian dogs and fowls he lies a prey nor was i near to close his dying eyes to wash his wounds to weep his obsequies to call about his corpse his crying friends or spread the mantle made for other ends on his dear body which i woe with care nor did my daily pains or nightly labour spare 
Where shall I find his corpse? What earth sustains his trunk dismembered and his cold remains? For this, alas, I left my needful ease, exposed my life to winds and winter seas. If any pity touch Rutulian hearts, here empty all your quivers, all your darts. Or if they fail, thou, Jove, conclude my woe, and send me thunderstruck to shades below. Her shrieks and clamours pierce the Trojans' ears, unman their courage and augment their fears. Nor young Ascanius could the sight sustain, nor old Ilionius his tears restrain. But Actor and Idaeus jointly sent to bear the madding mother to her tent. And now the trumpets terribly from far, with rattling clangor, rose the sleepy war. The soldiers' shouts succeed the brazen sounds, and heaven from pole to pole the noise rebounds. The Volsians bear their shields upon their head, and rushing forward form a moving shed. These fill the ditch, those pull the bulwarks down, some raise the ladders, others scale the town. But where void spaces on the walls appear, or thin defence, they pour their forces there. With pools and missive weapons from afar, the Trojans keep aloof the rising war. Taught by their ten years' siege defensive fight, they roll down ribs of rocks and unresisted white. To break the penthouse with a ponderous blow, would yet the patient Volsians undergo, but could not bear the unequal combat long, for where the Trojans find the thickest throng, the ruin falls, their shattered shields give way, and their crushed heads become an easy prey. They shrink for fear, abated of their rage, nor longer dare in a blind fight engage, contended now to gall them from below, with darts and slings and with a distant bow. Elsewhere, Mesentius, terrible to view, a blazing pine within the trenches threw. But brave Mesapus, Neptune's warlike son, broke down the palisades the trenches won, and loud for ladders calls to scale the town. Calliope, begin ye sacred nine, inspire your poet in his high design, to sing what slaughter manly Turnus made, what souls he sent below the Stygian shade, what fame the soldiers with their captain share, and the vast circuit of the fatal war. For you in singing martial facts excel, you best remember and alone can tell. There stood a tower amazing to the sight, built up of beams and of stupendous height. Art and the nature of the place conspired to furnish all the strength that war required. To level this the bold Italians join, the wary Trojans obviate their design. With weighty stones overwhelm their troops below, shoot through the loopholes and sharp javelins throw. Turnus, the chief, tossed from his thundering hand against the wooden walls a flaming brand. It stuck the fiery plague, the winds were high, the planks were seasoned and the timber dry. Contagion caught the posts it spread along, scorched and to distance drew the scattered throng. The Trojans fled, the fire pursued amain, still gathering fast upon the trembling train, till crowding to the corners of the wall, down the defence and the defenders fall. The mighty flaw makes heaven itself resound, the dead and dying Trojans strew the ground. The tower that followed on the fallen crew whelmed over their heads and buried whom it slew. Some stuck upon the darts themselves had sent, all the same equal ruin underwent. Young Lycus and Helenor only scaped, saved how they know not from the steepy leap. Helenor, elder of the two by birth, on one side royal, one a son of earth, whom to the Lydian king Lycumnia bare, and sent her boasted bastard to the war. 
a privilege which none but freemen share. Slight were his arms, a sword and silver shield, no marks of honor charged its empty field. Light as he fell, so light the youth arose, and rising found himself amidst his foes. Nor flight was left, nor hopes to force his way. Emboldened by despair he stood at bay, and like a stag whom all the troop surrounds, O eager huntsman and invading hounds, resolved on death, he dissipates his fears, and bounds aloft against the pointed spears. So dares the youth, secure of death and throes, his dying body on his thickest foes. But Lycus, swifter on his feet by far, runs, doubles, winds, and turns amidst the war, springs to the walls and leaves his foes behind, and snatches at the beam he first can find looks up and leaps aloft at all the stretch, in hopes the helping hand of some kind friend to reach. But Turnus followed hard his hunted prey, his spear had almost reached him in the way, short of his reins and scarce a span behind. Fool, said the chief, thou fleeter than the wind. Couldst thou presume to scape when I pursue? He said, and downward, by the feet he drew, the trembling dastard at the tug he falls, vast ruins come along, rent from the smoking walls. Thus on some silver swan or timorous hare, Jove's bird comes sousing down from upper air. Her crooked talons trust the fearful prey, then out of sight she soars and wings her way. So ceases the grim wolf the tender lamb, in vain lamented by the bleating dam. Then rushing onward with a barbarous cry, the troops of Turnus to the combat fly. The ditch with faggots filled, the daring foe, tossed firebrands to the steepy turrets throw. Ilonius, as bold as Lucetius came, to force the gate and feed the kindling flame, rolled down the fragment of a rock so right, it crushed him double underneath his weight. Two more young, Liger and Asila slow, to bend the bow, young Liger better knew. Asila's best the pointed javelin threw. Brave Caenius laid Ortigius on the plain. The victor Caenius was by Turnus slain. By the same hand, Clonius and Aetus fall, Sagar and Ida standing on the wall. From Carpus' arms his fate Privernus found, hurt by Temilla first but slight the wound. His shield thrown by, to mitigate the smart, he clapped his hand upon the wounded part. The second shaft came swift and unespied, and pierced his hand, and nailed it to his side. Transfixed his breathing lungs and beating heart, the soul came issuing out, and hissed against the dart. The son of Arcans shone amid the rest, in glittering armor and a purple vest. Fair was his face, his eyes inspiring love, bred by his father in the Martian grove, where the fat altars of Palicus flame, and send in arms to purchase early fame. Him, when he spied from far the Tuscan king, laid by the lance and took him to the sling. Thrice whirled the throng around his head and threw, the heated lead half melted as it flew. It pierced his hollow temples and his brain. The youth came tumbling down and spurned the plain. Then young Ascanius, who before this day was wont in woods to shoot the savage prey, first bent in martial strife the twanging bow and exercised against a human foe. With this bereft Numanus of his life, who Turnus' younger sister took to wife, Proud of his realm and of his royal bride, vaunting before his troops and lengthened with a stride, in these insulting terms the Trojans he defied. Twice conquered cowards, now your shame is shown, cooped up a second time within your town, who dare not issue forth in open field, but hold your walls before you for a shield. Thus threat you war, Thus our alliance force, what gods, what madness, hither steered your course. 
You shall not find the sons of Atreus here, nor need the frauds of sly Ulysses fear. Strong from the cradle of a sturdy brood, we bear our new-born infants to the flood. There bathed amid the stream our boys we hold, with winter hardened and inured to cold. They wake before the day to range the wood, kill ere they eat nor taste unconquered food. No sports but what belong to war they know, to break the stubborn colt, to bend the bow. Our youth of labor patient earn their breed, hardly they work with frugal diet fed. From ploughs and harrows sent to seek renown, they fight in fields and storm the shaken town. No part of life from toils of war is free, no change in age or difference in degree. We plough and till in arms our oxen feel, instead of goads the spur and pointed steel. The inverted lance makes furrows in the plain, even time that changes all, yet changes us in vain. The body, not the mind, nor can control, the immortal vigor or abate the soul. Our helms defend the young, disguise the gray. We live by plunder and delight in prey. Your vests embroidered with rich purple shine, in sloth you glory and in dances join. Your vests have sweeping sleeves with female pride, your turbans underneath your chins are tied. Go, Phrygians, to your dindimus again. Go less than women in the shape of men. Go mixed with eunuchs in the mother's rites, where with unequal sound the flute invites. Sing, dance, and howl by turns in Ida's shade. Resign the war to men who know the martial trade. This foul reproach Ascanius could not hear, with patience or a vowed revenge forbear. At the full stretch of both his hands he drew, and almost joined the horns of the tough yew. But first before the throne of Jove he stood, and thus with lifted hands invoked the god. My first attempt, great Jupiter, succeed, an annual offering in thy grove shall bleed. A snow-white steer before thy altar led, Who, likes his mother, bears aloft his head, Butts with his threatening brows, and bellowing stands, And dares the fight, and spurns the yellow sands. Joe bowed the heavens, and lent a gracious ear, And thundered on the left amidst the clear, Sounded at once the bow, and swiftly flies The feathered death, and hisses through the skies. The steel through both his temples forced the way, Extended on the ground Numanus lay. Go now, vain boaster, and true valor scorn, The Phrygians twice subdued, yet make this third return. Ascanius said no more, the Trojans shake, The heavens with shouting and new vigor take. Apollo then bestrode a golden cloud to view the feats of arms and fighting crowd. And thus the beardless victor he bespoke aloud. Advance, illustrious youth, increase in fame, and wide from east to west extend thy name. Offspring of gods thyself, and Rome shall owe to thee a race of demigods below. This is the way to heaven, the powers divine, from this beginning date the Julian line. To thee, to them, and their victorious heirs, the conquered war is due, and the vast world is theirs. Troy is too narrow for thy name, he said, and plunging downward shot his radiant head, dispelled the breathing air that broke his flight, shorn of his beams a man to mortal sight. Old Bootus' form he took, Anchise's squire, now left to rule Ascanius by his sire. His wrinkled visage and his hoary hairs, his mien, his habit, and his arms he wears, and thus salutes the boy to forward for his years. Suffice it thee, thy father's worthy son, the warlike prize thou hast already won. The god of archers gives thy youth a part, of his own praise, nor envies equal art. Now tempt the war no more, 
he said and flew, obscure in air, and vanished from their view. The Trojans by his arms their patron know, and hear the twanging of his heavenly bow. Then duteous force they use, and Phoebus' name, to keep from fight the youth to fond of fame. Undaunted they themselves no danger shun, from wall to wall the shouts and clamors run. They bend their bows, they whirl their slings around, heaps of spent arrows fall and strew the ground, and helms and shields and rattling arms resound. The combat thickens like the storm that flies from westward when the showery kids arise, or pattering hail comes pouring on the main when Jupiter descends in hardened rain or bellowing clouds burst with a stormy sound, and with an armed winter strew the ground. Pandrus and Bitsias thunderbolts of war, whom Hiera to bold Alcanor bear, on Ida's top to youth of height and size, like first that on their mother mountain rise, presuming on their force the gates unbar, and of their own accord invite the war. With fates averse against the king's command, Armed on the right and on the left they stand, And flank the passage, shining steel they wear, And waving crests above their heads appear. Thus two tall oaks that Pardus banks adorn, Lift up to heaven their leafy heads unshorn, And overpressed with nature's heavy load, Dance to the whistling winds and at each other nod. In flows a tide of Latians when they see the gates at opened and the passage free. Bold Quercens with rash Tamarus rushing on, Equicolus that in bright armor shone, and Haemon first, but soon repulsed they fly, or in the well defended pass they die. These with success are fired, and those with rage, and each on equal terms at length engage drawn from their lines and issuing on the plain, the Trojans hand to hand the fight maintain. Fierce Turnus in another quarter fought, when suddenly the unhoped-for news was brought. The foes had left the fastness of their place, prevailed in fight, and had his men in chase. He quits the attack, and to prevent their fate, runs where the giant brothers guard the gate. The first he met, Antipatus the brave, but base begotten on a Theban slave, Sardeon's son he slew the deadly dart, found passage through his breast and pierced his heart. Fixed in the wound the Italian cornel stood, warmed in his lungs and in his vital blood. Aphidnus next and Erymantus dies, and Meropus and the gigantic size of Bitsias threatening with his ardent eyes, not by the feeble dart he fell oppressed, a dart were lost within that roomy breast, but from a knotted lance, large, heavy, strong, which roared like thunder as it whirled along. Not two bull hides the impetuous force withhold, nor coat of double mail with scales of gold. Down sunk the monster bulk and pressed the ground, his arms and clattering shield on the vast body sound. Not with less ruin than the Bayan mole, raised on the seas, the surges to control. At once comes tumbling down the rocky wall, prone to the deep the stone's disjointed fall. Of the vast pile the scattered ocean flies, black sands discolored froth and mingled mud arise. The frighted billows roll and seek the shores, then trembles Procyta, then Ischia roars. Typhius, thrown beneath by Jove's command, astonished at the flaw that shakes the land, soon shifts his weary side and scarce awake, with wonder feels the weight press lighter on his back. The warrior god the Latian troops inspired, New strung their sinews and their courage fired, but chills the Trojan hearts with cold affright, then black despair precipitates their flight. When Pandarus beheld his brother killed, the town with fear and wild confusion filled, he turns the hinges of the heavy gate with both his hands and adds his shoulders to the weight, 
Some happier friends within the walls enclosed, the rest shut out to certain death exposed. Fool as he was, and franting in his care, to admit young Turnus and include the war. He thrust amid the crowd, securely bold, like a fierce tiger pent amid the fold. Too late his blazing buckler they descry, and sparkling fires that shoot from either eye, his mighty members and his ample breast, his ratting armor and his crimson crest. Far from that hated face the Trojans flee, all but the fool who sought his destiny. Mad Pandarus steps forth with vengeance vowed, for Beatia's death and threatens thus aloud. These are not Ardea's walls, nor his the town. Armata proffers with Lavinia's crown. Tis hostile earth you tread, of hope bereft. No means of safe return by flight are left. To whom with countenance calm and soul sedate, Thus Turnus, then begin and try thy fate. My message to the ghost of Priam bear, Tell him a new Achilles sent thee there. A lance of tough ground ash the Trojan threw, Rough in the rind and knotted as it grew. With his full force he whirled it first around, But the soft yielding air received the wound. Imperial Juno turned the course before, And fixed the wandering weapon in the door. But hope not thou, said Turnus, when I strike, to shun thy fate, our force is not alike, nor thy steel tempered by the Lemnian god. Then rising on his outmost stretch he stood, and aimed from high the full descending blow, cleaves the broad front and beardless cheeks in two. Down sinks the giant with a thundering sound, his ponderous limbs oppress the trembling ground. Blood, brains, and foam gush from the gaping wound. Scalp, face, and shoulders the keen steel divides, and the shard visage hangs on equal sides. The Trojans fly from their approaching fate, and had the victor then secured the gate, and to his troops without unclosed the bars, one lucky day had ended all his wars. But boiling youth and blind desire of blood pushed his fury to pursue the crowd. Hamstringed behind, unhappy Gigas died, then Phalaris is added to his side. The pointed javelins from the dead he drew, and their friends' arms against their fellows threw. Strong Harlus stands in vain, weak Phlegus flies, Saturnia still at hand, new force and fire supplies. Then Harlus, Britannus, Alcander fall, engaged against the foes who scaled the wall. But whom they feared without, they found within. But whom they feared without, they found within. At last, though late, by Lynceus he was seen. He calls new succors and assaults the prince. But weak his force and vain is their defense. Turned to the right, his sword the hero drew, and at one blow the bold aggressor slew. He joins the neck, and with a stroke so strong, the helm flies off and bears the head along. Next him the huntsman Amicus he killed, in darts in Venkond and in poison skilled. Then Cletus fell beneath his fatal spear, and Cretius, whom the muses held so dear, he fought with courage, and he sung the fight. Arms were his business versus his delight. The Trojan chiefs behold with rage and grief their slaughtered friends and hasten their relief. Bold Menestus rallies first the broken train whom brave Serestus and his troop sustain. To save the living and revenge the dead, against one warrior's arms all Troy they led. O oh, void of sense and courage, Menestus cried, Where can you hope your coward heads to hide? Ah, where beyond these rampires can you run? One man, and in your camp enclosed you shun. Shall then a single sword such slaughter boast, And pass unpunished from a numerous host? Forsaking honor and renouncing fame, Your gods, your country, and your king you shame. 
This just reproach their virtue does excite. They stand, they join, they thicken to the fight. Now Turnus doubts, and yet disdains to yield, but with slow paces measures back the field, and inches to the walls where Tiber's tide, washing the camp, defends the weaker side. The more he loses, they advance the more, and tread in every step he trod before. They shout, they bear him back, and whom by might they cannot conquer, they oppress with weight. As compassed with a wood of spears around, the lordly lion still maintains his ground, grins horrible, retires, and turns again, threats his distended paws, and shakes his mane. He loses while in vain he presses on, nor will his courage let him dare to run. So Turnus fares, and unresolved of flight, moves tardy back, and just recedes from fight. Yet twice in rage the combat he renews, twice breaks, and twice his broken foes pursues. But now they swarm, and with fresh troops supplied, come rolling on and rush from every side. Nor Juno, who sustained his arms before, dares with new strength suffice the exhausted store. For Joe, with sour commands, sent Iris down to force the invader from the frighted town. With labor spent, no longer can he wield the heavy fanchion or sustain the shield. Overwhelmed with darts, which from afar they fling, the weapons round his hollow temples ring. His golden helm gives way with stony blows, battered and flat and beaten to his brows. His crest is rashed away, his ample shield is falsified and round with javelins filled. The foe now faint, the Trojans overwhelm, and Menestus lays hard load upon his helm. Six sweet succeeds, he drops at every pore, with driving dust his cheeks are pasted o'er. Shorter and shorter every gasp he takes, and vain efforts and hurtless blows he makes. Plunged in the flood, and may the waters fly, the yell of God, the welcome burthen bore, and whipped the sweet and washed away the gore, then gently wafts him to the farther coast, and sends him safe to cheer his anxious host. End of Book Nine of the Any Eat.